Hey guys, Scott here. Before we get started, I want to bring you up to speed with a couple exciting things that the sponsors of this show have going on. First of all, you're not going to believe this, but the guys over at Origin have flipped their lid. They've come out with pumpkin milk. Yes, pumpkin flavored protein powder. Now, if you've used milk already, you realize this is already the best protein powder in the business. And now you can get it in a flavor you've never had before. Go over to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash origin and use mountain 10 and give this a try. I promise you'll never be the same once you've tried this. Also, Hero Soap has come out with a brand new line of body wash. Now listen, gentlemen, this is not your teenage self's body wash. This will make you smell like a man all over and get you ready for any interaction you've got coming up with women. And I'll tell you something, I'm going to leave it a surprise for now, but wait until you see one of the scents they have just in time for holiday season coming up. Yes, sir. It's all there for you at mountaintoppodcast.com front slash hero soap. And once again, you can use mountain 10 as your coupon code there to get an extra 10% off. And now guys buckle up. I've got a returning guest. She is a very nice, sweet lady and very smart too. Her name is Iris Ben Ruby, and this is guaranteed to power you up with newfound confidence and a drive to succeed, not only with women, but in your career and, well, life in general. So here we go. Live from the mist and shrouded mountaintop fortress that is X and Y Communications Headquarters, you're listening to the world-famous Mountaintop Podcast. And now, here's your host, Scott McKay. How's it going, gentlemen? Welcome to yet another episode of the world-famous Mountaintop Podcast. My name is Scott McKay, at Scott McKay on Twitter and Parlor. Real Scott McKay on Instagram. You can find us on the web at mountaintoppodcast.com and on YouTube at Scott McKay. If you haven't joined the Facebook group, please drop everything, hit pause, go do that right now so I can approve you into the group of men who are high character and looking to get the greatest woman they've ever met into their life sooner rather than later. It's all there for you at mountaintoppodcast.com. With me today is a returning guest. I really like this lady. She's down to earth. She's super smart. She cares about both men and women. And what's more, she cares about both men and women in good, solid, happy relationships together, which is what we're all about. And today we have an extra special topic. And I'm really excited about this. And the topic is you have more power than you think. We're going to talk about those little hidden places, maybe hiding under a rock or certainly away from the light being shown on it in your life where you can actually do something. Even if your whole life you've been led to believe or even taught by your parents or your friends or or your boss or whomever that you have no control over it. So this is going to be an empowering, uplifting show at a time in history where all of us could probably use it, right? So without anything further, my good friend Iris Ben Ruby from Toronto, Canada. Welcome back, Iris. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, I have no idea where it's going to go, but I know that you're really smart and that you care about people and you talk about going from good to great all the time. So Hey, you know, especially given that one of our lead sponsors for this show is Origin Maine, which is run by Jocko Willink, who pretty much is the king of what he calls extreme ownership or taking control and not being a victim. Uh, You know, I think this is going to be something that uh, is not only timely at this point in uh, North American history, but something that a lot of guys will find actionable and they'll be able to run with it. And to kind of kick things off here, Iris... It seems like so many of us want to just relax into victimhood rather than finding personal power. It's almost like a lot of people out there, certainly not everybody, and probably in particular not many of the guys listening to this show, uh, but a lot of people really seem like they want to find ways that they're powerless instead of finding ways to be empowered. What's up with that kind of psychology? 
Well, I think a lot of it is how we're brought up in childhood. What what did your parents model to you? Did they encourage you to find your own solutions? Did they tell you, be careful, be careful, don't don't go here, don't do that, you might get hurt. And so that teaches a child to not stretch out of their comfort zone. And so it all depends on what are the stories, and we're going to talk a lot about stories today, is what are the stories that you learned in childhood in terms of do you get a say what were your parents' histories in terms of did they choose each other? Did they stay with each other because they, quote unquote, didn't have a choice? And that informs you until you listen to like a show like this and then your eyes are open to something new. Well, you know, it's interesting that you would mention that. I grew up with very overprotective parents. And looking back, I think they felt like they were doing the right thing. They didn't want me to get hurt. They didn't want me to have something bad happen to me. They didn't even want my feelings hurt. They wanted me to go and be good at everything and have this charmed life. And yet, by the time I was in fifth and sixth grade and I wasn't allowed to do some of the things my peers were able to do because my parents thought it would harm me in some way, it just it just wrought havoc on my self-esteem. I just felt like, okay, well, I'm not as good as those kids. I don't get to see these movies. I don't get to participate in these activities. My eyes don't get to see what they get to see, and it just made me feel like less, not more. So I guess I was physically protected, but certainly not psychologically, you know? Yeah, and the intent was to keep you safe. The outcome was the world's a dangerous place. Be careful. You can't handle this. And then as a child, all you can do is internalize it, not say, oh, this is what my parents thought. As a child, you go, oh, there's something wrong with me that I can't handle it and everybody else can well, the other part of that, now that you're talking about it, that I think is fascinating, is a lot of times parents have a vision for their children. Instead of looking objectively and perhaps evaluating is an equally good term to use here, objectively, who their kids are and what they're capable of, what their talents are, and indeed what their real world limitations might be, and we all have them, they project onto those kids sort of this vicarious list of goals or personal needs that they would like for those kids to fulfill. I mean, we've all seen the father who trots his kid out to Little League Baseball thinking he's going to be the next Nolan Ryan or, you know, Hank Aaron. <laughs> and and the kid just doesn't want to be there, doesn't want to play baseball. And his dad's forcing him into it because, well, because he needs the kid to do that, not because the kid needs to do that. And how can we as adults – kind of reconcile those expectations our parents had for us compared to what it is we've wanted all along. I mean, that's kind of a thing, isn't it? That That is really the key to living a happy life. It's really looking at what are our inherited conversations. I have to be an accountant like all the men in my family. That's what my dad did and what my grandfather did. I have to be athletic just like my father who played soccer and blah, blah, blah. And so it's looking at the things that were imposed on us, often out of good intention, and looking at, is this what I want to take on for my life? Does this fill me with joy? Do I walk away feeling fulfilled, recharged, ready to take on life? Or does it become another chore to take on that just drains you? Once you have that awareness, you have choice. And in choice is where you are no longer a victim. Wow. Isn't that powerful? I love everything you just said. And I am thinking on so many levels right now, I want to get to them all. I feel like a kid in a candy store with this topic already. I think the first thing that comes to mind is all of these stories were told as if they're fact by the people we trust most in life, our parents, our siblings, our educators. And I think, you know, that's pretty much obvious how that would affect us because those are the people we know the best and people whose opinions we look up to. But I think at a meta level, there's this lie, frankly, that you are going to become your parents someday. Oh, yeah. You know, you'll grow up and your kids, you'll raise them the same way we're raising you. You know, you're from our gene pool. And I'll tell you something. Look, my parents did a great job raising us overall. They made mistakes, especially with me, because I'm the oldest, right? You know, that's part of the birth order thing. <laughs> but I made it a point not to overprotect our children. And 
I've gone over on this show exactly what we do with our kids with the traveling and the sports and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I have gritty, tough little kids who really think they're going to take over the world someday. Yet, I have people who fall under the helicopter parent category, right, who think we're nuts, maybe even think we're abusive parents because we would do this. I mean, how dare you take your children to some, you know, developing country where they may get food poisoning or something bad may happen. How dare you? You know, it's like Greta Thunberg, right? How dare you strap a crash helmet onto a five-year-old little girl who's not even in kindergarten yet and send her out there to do basically an extreme sport? You know, we hear it. You know, we have our own little echo chamber of parents who are like us, who encourage us and say, go, go, go. But there are differing opinions about all this. And yet the fact remains the same, doesn't it? We honestly do have a choice whether or not we're going to accept that narrative blindly or do something about it and go live our own life instead of, you know, going to Yale Law School like my father and my grandfather did automatically. I mean, I've heard from guys. I've coached them who have Ivy degrees and they were like, I didn't even want this. Or they're doing something for a living that their family's been doing for five generations or they took over the family business just because they were supposed to. And they wake up one day and go, I don't want to be here. It's like the old talking head song. This is not my beautiful house. This is not my beautiful life, right? What do you have to say about that? First of all, how can we recognize that that sort of stuck thinking is going on in our head and free ourselves up to maybe think of an alternative or three? Yeah, so I'm going to give you a really easy shortcut to identify the things, the stories that you're tied to and may not be aware of. And when you're not aware of it, you don't have choice. So start to write down all the things that you can't do, be, have. I can't change careers. I can't be an extrovert. I should. I should go home and mow the lawn. I should go pay my bills tonight. So all the can'ts and the shoulds are the stories that drive you. And they're stories that don't give you choice. Once you start to write them down, you want to start to challenge them. Is it true that I can't change careers just because I've got my MBA or just because I've put in 20 years into this career? It's about looking at the stories you tell yourself. Everything we do is based on the stories we tell ourselves. It's like you, Scott, you've told yourself a certain story around how you're going to bring your children up and you live it, but you're doing it from a conscious place, from a choice. You knew that you were handed these stories from your parents. You looked at it and went, nope, not how I want to do it going forward. And there's one thing to be aware of. Often we either do exactly what our parents did or we do the exact opposite. In either of those, there's no choice. When we start to become aware and we we look at it and go, this is what I want to do rather than this is what I would never do, then we have power. We can exercise choice. What a brilliant point in that rebellion is actually less self-empowering than we think. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we're just knee-jerking to do the opposite of everything our parents told us to do, we're still their puppets. We're still not thinking for ourselves. I love that you said that because I don't think I've ever heard anybody articulate that idea ever. Certainly not as fluently as you just did. But yeah, if you're saying, hey, look, I was raised this way. I was told to do this. So, you know, it's like a Rage Against the Machine song. Screw you. I won't do what you told me just because you told me to do it. (laughs) That person, whatever influenced you there is still living rent free in your head just as much as if you were falling in line like a good little steward of their wishes for you. I mean, all of that is so powerful to me. And then you're talking about what you do for a living, right? You're talking about maybe even your personality type. Am I a nice brainiac who buries myself in books and I wasn't born or bred to be an athlete? At least that's what my parents told me. Uh, Those kind of things. We mentioned the family business, but you know, I would extrapolate from there. Your religion. I've talked to so many guys who were raised in a certain faith and they just figured I'm not allowed to change what I believe. And then they walk around feeling like total hypocrites because they really don't believe what they're 
told they have to believe, yet they really don't know what else to believe because they've never explored it, because they've never been given the freedom to, and they dare not go back to their family lest they be shunned, you know? Actually, that's brilliant because what this talks to is about the consequences. If we're going to change religion, there's huge consequences like being shunned, losing our sense of belonging. And all of our choices are based on consequences. Which are the consequences I'm willing to pay? Stay in the religion, leave the religion. Stay in this career that I've been doing, leave this career. Stay the brainiac develop my athletic abilities but each of them has a consequence and we make our decision based on the consequences we're willing to pay because each one of them has consequences yes absolutely there are people in our lives who care about us there are histories there are scripts that we've written for ourselves and a lot of water under the bridge and a lot leveraged there and a lot that hinges on that and when we decide, hey, you know what? I don't feel like myself here. I feel like I'm living a lie. I feel like I've got to do something different. You have to give up a lot for the potential gain of personal power, personal freedom, personal congruence and integrity. And for better or worse, Iris, we have to weigh those costs versus benefits. Kind of sad, but definitely true. It's a fact of life. Well, it's true about every decision we make or don't make. It's two sides of the coin. Staying in that career is safe, but it costs you. Leaving that career will fill you with something that you're more passionate about. But again, it'll cost you. So it's just simply looking at what's the kind of life that I want to live and what am I willing to pay in order to get the payoff. Yeah, you know, something that comes to mind as you're talking is this idea that people sort of get set in their ways. And we've talked about that idea relative to relationships very recently on this show. But in my life and in the lives of lots of other people, men and women who I've talked to professionally or even socially, nothing really changed for them until their hand was forced, you know, until their proverbial cheese was moved. They had to hit rock bottom before they bounced. And in my case, of course, I had what I felt like was a dream job. You know, in reality, it was a very empty existence working for a Fortune 50 company, making a Fortune 10 company richer. And yet it took me getting kicked to the curb, laid off from my dream job. And at the same time, having my crazy first wife divorce me and kick me to the curb for me to have nothing left and to really be forced to do something different. And I tell guys all the time on this show and in real life that I wouldn't be here today living the dream with the right woman, doing what I really feel fulfilled by and feel like I'm leaving the world a better place by doing had someone allowed me to continue in mediocrity. I just wouldn't have gotten around to changing. And your show is inviting your listeners to make that decision before they hit rock bottom. Yes. You know, I call that being unsettled. And interestingly enough, I did a group coaching program that I talked about on this show earlier in 2020. And I organized that and developed the concept for it before COVID hit. And after COVID hit, it became more important than ever because a lot of people got their cheese moved by this virus, whether they liked it or not. Some in tragic, devastating fashion, of course, but lots of guys lost their jobs. Lots of guys found they couldn't be social anymore. They couldn't do the things they loved that were out and about and with other people. And a lot of people were alone and didn't have any income anymore. And that's in a big way for a lot of people hitting rock bottom, even though they didn't really ever deserve it per se. And to make matters either better or worse, depending on your perspective, we're all going through this at the same time. It's a global phenomenon. So this idea of finding power where we feel like we've had it stripped away from us is a huge, huge deal for everybody. And I'm finding right now that depending on who you're hanging out with, you're either going to descend into the depths of self-pity and wallowing in powerlessness and victimhood, or you're going to find people who can support one another on this path back to greatness, right? You know, here, here's my thought on it, okay? I think you have two kinds of coronavirus people. People who have 
just the sky is falling. This is the worst time to be alive. Oh, woe is me, chicken little. And other people, guys especially, who go, I'm too macho for this. I'm not hurting at all. You know, I'm just going to power through this. And then they don't engage in the self-care that they need to engage in to be as resilient as they should be through this. But that wasn't really my point as much as if you find the right people who are positive, you know, we're, we have a chance to build each other through this because there's certain camaraderie in the COVID-19 epic, you know. And underneath that, Scott, there's really looking at there's some things that we can't affect. We can't change the speed of traffic. We can't impact whether we get, we lose our job, but what we can impact is how we react to it. Do we become a victim? Do we become hopeless? Do we become angry and reactive? Or do we take away from this, what did I learn? What are the skills that I have that came out of this? And how do I become a better person? How do I become what I call more resilient, have more skills, more tools in my toolbox as I move forward in my life, rather than feel like I'm going further down and getting stuck and have no power? Yeah, you betcha. And that whole idea of understanding who we really are. Having that foundational sense of what I'm good at and what maybe I really wasn't born to do, what I call having sober judgment of self, is important because it helps you build your identity and helps you point your talents and your ambitions towards something that's going to be both profitable and enjoyable for you. And let's add meaningful to the mix there, too, rather than just beating your head against the wall. And again, a great example of this kind of negative opposite control, if you will, someone would have over your life uh, comes into play again here. Like if someone says, you can't do that, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, uh, you're not athletic enough, and your response based on your personality type is, yeah, well, you know what, I'm going to prove you wrong. And then you spend the next 10 years beating your head against the wall trying to do something that, frankly, the third party was correct about. You know, you're not really cut out for this. It's something I see people do. And it's just a very prideful waste of life and lack of sober judgment, isn't it? Yeah. And on the flip side, I can tell you from my own experience, my mother used to tell me, Iris will turn the whole world upside down and she'll achieve what she wants. And for decades, I followed that. And anything that got in my way, I kept pushing and pushing and overcoming blocks. And I got to my goal. And it took me decades to realize that it's just a story that ran me. And I didn't always need to push so hard or to push through the blocks. Sometimes the blocks were there for a good reason and I needed to redirect. So sometimes even those stories that we think are empowering can be disempowering if we're not aware of them and making choices. Anytime that these stories lack balance, right? Your parents are either telling you you're no good, you're going to amount to nothing, and they make fun of you, and frankly, they're abusive, obviously, uh, emotionally abusive. Yeah, okay, that kind of sticks out like a sore thumb, doesn't it? But when parents push, 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 and you can never do enough, and you're never smart enough, and you're never talented enough, and if you get second place, you're the first loser, man, that wrecks a kid's psychology as well. So as you grow up and you gain this sober sense of judgment, it kind of helps you, well, to kind of describe what you just articulated It helps you become really sharp about discerning the difference between perseverance and raw stubbornness, doesn't it? Yeah. What do I want versus what is driving me on an unconscious level? Yeah, right. Because people are like, never, ever, ever give up. Well, you know what? Sometimes this is no fun. It's not working for you. It's not getting you any kind of results you're even happy about. And you don't even know where it's going, but you don't want to be a quote unquote quitter. So In your mind, you're persevering, but you're really just fitting the classic dictionary definition of stubbornness. You know, perseverance means I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. I want this. I am committed to it for good, solid reason that I've internalized and that are my own. And I can see the goal. I can do this. I got this. So I'm really glad you brought that up. I want to turn our attention to a couple areas that I know guys may be talking to themselves inside of their head in ways that aren't particularly productive and aren't conducive to personal power. The first one is, hey, you know what? I'm just not a very masculine guy. I'm wimpy. I'm nerdy. This is what I do. This is who I am. I can't change it. I don't have a whole lot of style. And that's just the way I've been since high school. That's the way I'm always going to be. 
we have control over that. We have control over our levels of courage. We certainly have control over our personal style. We have control over just a wide spectrum of mindsets. And yet, sometimes guys default into, quote unquote, being set in their ways and saying, yeah, you know what, this is just who I am, and I guess I'm going to die this way. What do you have to say to that? Yeah, there's a couple things. You know, there's two ways to look at it. One of them is to look at, is this how I want to be? Does this fulfill me? Am I passionate about the way I am? And if not, start to make some choices. Look at what are some alternatives and start to take little steps. The flip side to that is often when we feel we are too much of something or not enough of something, we feel like we're not good enough. And so what happens to our confidence is it starts to go down. And it's not attractive, not in terms of if you're going to apply for a job, if you're going to go on a date. It's really about getting who you are and what your gifts are. And sometimes nerdiness is a gift. Sometimes being a brainiac is a gift. Sometimes being athletic is a gift. It's simply choosing who do I want to be and feeling good about it. And that's what makes you attractive to the world. Now, it could be about romantic relationship, but it's also in terms of friendship. Look at the people you're attracted to. And I don't mean sexually. The people out there that are really attractive are the people that aren't cocky, but are confident about who they are and what they have to offer. Yeah, two things there jump to mind. First of all, is the idea that so many of us think if I were just some other way, if I just had some other skill set, some other set of gifts that other guys have that I don't, then I would be attractive. Then I would be successful. Whereas the guys who really own who they are, they understand who they are. They have a sober sense of self, right? And they're the best version of that they can be, the most authentic, excellent version of that real persona who they really are, that they can be. Those are the guys who just crush it out there at work, in their social circle, and indeed with women. And the other thing that goes along with that is my theory as to why most self-help operations that people undertake fail. And that surrounds the idea of authenticity. Being fake is one of the greatest social faux pas in the minds of most people here in North American or Western culture, if you will. Nobody wants to be someone they're not. Yet what you just alluded to is the idea that, you know, who you authentically are isn't necessarily, you know, who you are right now in terms of mindset and practice. It's really who you would like to be. Because if you're not doing what you want to do and you're not the person you want to be, who are we to tell you that you got to be stuck there? You can tell yourself, I'd really rather be more accomplished in this area. I'd rather change my mindset to be more confident. I'd rather be able to make decisions more quickly than I always have. And yet we have to be intentional. We have to go through that whole Malcolm Gladwellian series of being unconsciously incompetent to realizing we suck to making an effort to do well, which feels really inauthentic when we're actively out there trying to change habits before we get to that coveted place of unconscious competence. And people just really feel like phonies when they're being consciously competent. But that's the work we need to put in to ascend to that place where we're actually who we want to be. And I would argue, guys, Be the guy you want to be. Always push towards that man you picture yourself being because at worst, that's equally authentic to who you are right now. But at best, it's the truly authentic version of yourself. It's the self-actualized version, right? Yeah, and if I can break it down into a couple little pieces is when we're happy, we are confident. So your job is to figure out what is it that makes you happy or would make you happy and start to take steps towards it. Yeah, beautiful. I love it. I mean, confidence is a belief in your own competence. So certainly that's all tied together, right? And happiness to me is kind of a combination of being content, feeling like you have a future to look forward to, and having reconciled and being at peace with your past. You know, we actually had a show about that, and I had always thought of it in present tense. And my guest on that show, who was a very smart psychologist, kind of set me straight that it's more like this Charles Dickens deal of the ghost of Christmas past, present, and future all conspire to make us happier, miserable. And I really like what he had to say about that. 
And what I'll do is I'll put in the notes which show that was because I'm not about to remember which particular episode that was, but I think it would be a nice reference for the guys listening. So I'll put that in the notes for you guys at mountaintoppodcast.com. Before we close, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about how guys underestimate their power to get the right woman in their life. And I'll just tee up this conversation by mentioning this. A lot of guys feel like they have to settle for whatever woman chooses them. That if they went out and actually sought the kind of woman who makes them happy, that would be tantamount to some sort of pipe dream. Because, you know, there's always the one who gets away. Guys don't really ever get the woman they really want, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's self-talk that I'm not good enough. And perhaps the ironic part in the world of dating and relationships is women I talk to talk to themselves the exact same way. I'll never really find the guy I want and I'll have to settle for Mr. Good Enough instead of quote unquote Mr. Right. But what I think, Iris, is when we're doing what we call deserving what we want, which to be honest is the essence of what this whole show is about. I am going to be one half of a great relationship because I'm going to represent to my future partner what they're looking for, just like they're going to do that for me. We reflect that to each other and therefore we have a happy relationship. I honestly believe that when we're approaching that self-actualization, when we're authentically happy with who we are and confident about it, we're going to be thrilled at who we attract and honestly and truthfully, and I will back this up with not only personal experience, but the experience of countless, countless scores of guys I've coached, that the kind of woman we're looking for is also looking for us at that point because we're honestly connecting. We're honestly right for each other. So we actually have no business not seeking out, approaching, and going after relationships with exactly the kind of women we want because those women are actually more likely to like us in return and fall in love with us and live happily ever after or whatever in return than we've ever guessed. But our psychology plays tricks on us, right? Yeah, and it's really important to remember that when you're confident about who you are, you stop settling. When you stop settling, you stop putting up with things in relationship that don't work for you and reinforce that you don't feel good enough about yourself. When you feel good about yourself and you're confident, you start to actively make choices in alignment with what you're looking for. This is what we've been talking this whole show. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I think guys really wanted to hear that. And that's an excellent, excellent message to end on. This has been a show that's uplifting and empowering at a point in history where we certainly need it. So I really appreciate you coming on and talking about it, Iris. And I want to go ahead and send guys to where you can pick up a copy of Iris's book, From Lonely and Single to Loved and Adored. That's on Amazon for you. And I have set up a link as always. That's mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Iris, I-R-I-S. And she's just as excellent an author as she is a speaker and a coach. So definitely get yourself a copy of that. The name of the book, again, is From Lonely and Single to Loved and Adored. You can go to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Iris and pick it up. And I'll tell you what, guys, I'll also put it at the top of the queue on my Amazon influencer page, which is, as always, mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Amazon. Iris, thank you so much for such a fantastic conversation. We covered so many all important points. And I think, you know, we pretty much hit the nail on the head. We covered most of it. This is great. Thank you. Well, thank you. If I could have had one last thing is that for our listeners, whatever decision it is that you make for yourself, whatever vision, your future, your goal, you can do it. Oh, that's such a great denouement to this whole show. Love it. And guys, listen, what we're talking about here is absolutely true. If you've been settling your whole life because you've adopted a narrative you don't even believe in, let's, let's talk about that. Let's get you on the right track. Let's get you in the right career. Let's talk about getting the woman in your life you really want for a change instead of just the women who fall into your lap. You can do this, guys. You can change the course of your life. You have more control than you think. You don't have to be a victim. You don't have to be at the whim of your parents. You don't have to be at the whim of someone else. There doesn't have to be anybody living rent-free in your head. And it all starts with a 25-minute phone call with me personally where we put a plan of action together to get you from where you are right now to where you really want to be. That's all there for you at mountaintoppodcast.com. And as always, while you're there, please visit the fine folks at Origin Maine, Hero Soap, and Keyport. And when you do... 
be sure to use the coupon code MOUNTAIN10 for 10% off any order. And until I talk to you again real soon, this is Scott McKay from X and Y Communications in San Antonio, Texas. Be good out there. The Mountaintop Podcast is produced by X and Y Communications. All rights reserved worldwide. Be sure to visit www.mountaintoppodcast.com for show notes. And while you're there, sign up for the free X and Y Communications newsletter for men. This is Ed Roy Odom speaking for The Mountaintop Podcast.